Good evening and welcome to the Redwood Library in Athenaeum. My name is Benedict Lecca, Executive Director, and I'm speaking to you from the historic Harrison Room, the nation's first purpose-built library space. This evening's lecture, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Jerry Wells as he discusses George Barclay, why he mattered to Newport and why he matters today. Uh, Berkeley, Barclay, uh, as we know, Barclay is the British pronunciation. Um, Barclay had strong ties to Newport and to the Redwood Library itself, being the central figure of the philosophical society that uh, eventually morphed into the group of founders of the Redwood Library. Now, this program is being presented in collaboration with the Colonial Dames of Rhode Island. And they, of course, also administer uh, Whitehall in Middletown, uh, Barclays residence. So we're very grateful to them and also to Redwood member Bird Stats for all of her assistance. Now, Jerry Wells is the director of the Educational Leadership and Ministry Program at Yale Divinity School and the Communications Coordinator for Barclay Divinity School, the Episcopal Seminary at Yale. He joined the staff at Barclay after a career at, as an educational leader in independent schools in Atlanta and Virginia. He is the author of the forthcoming book, In Illaque Ultra Sunt, A History of Barclay Divinity School. He and his wife, Della, who is the rector of Emmanuel Church, have lived in Newport since 2019. So I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening and please help me welcome Mr. Jerry Wells. Thank you all so much. Good evening. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight uh, as part of the 275th anniversary celebration of the Redwood Library and Athenaeum. And I would like to thank Patricia Pettit of the Redwood and Bert Stats and Mary Twitchell and other members of the Rhode Island chapter of the Colonial Dames of America for the invitation to participate in this event. And just a, a, a word here about the pronunciation of the subject matter. Uh, I work at Berkeley Divinity School at Yale, and my habit has been to say Berkeley, Berkeley, Berkeley. And so while the British would have pronounced uh, George Berkeley as George Barclay uh, in his day, and certainly uh, thereafter, uh, Berkeley is what I'm going to default to for that reason. Um, so hang on just one second, we're gonna get started. So tonight I will be discussing uh, the famous philosopher, Bishop George Berkeley, who lived in Newport from 1729 until 1731, and his impact on this community and his continued relevance today. I'd like to begin this discussion here at the Redwood with a bit of a trivia question. Just what is an Athenaeum? And why is the Redwood both a library and an Athenaeum? In ancient Rome, the word originally denoted a school, but later referred to a building, which contains a library. And then later, even more broadly, it referred to an institution for the promotion of learning. So named in honor of Athena, the goddess of wisdom sprung from the forehead of Zeus. How fitting then that this, the oldest purpose-built public library in America, was conceived not only as a place that housed a collection of books, but also as a gathering place whose express purpose from the outset was to propagate virtue, knowledge, and useful learning with nothing in view but the good of mankind. And given this classic classical reference point, how fitting then that this magnificent building, um, the first commissioned work by the great Newport architect, Peter Harrison, was designed as a Doric Roman temple 
modeled after the 16th century designs of Andrea Palladio. So what was the cultural climate of Newport in the mid 18th century that made it, and not Boston or Philadelphia or New York, the place where such a landmark monument to learning and knowledge was first established? Well, one answer lies three and a half miles away from the Redwood Library, where there is another slightly older, but also well-preserved example of 18th century colonial architecture, George Berkeley's Whitehall. Originally the homestead of the Whipple family who farmed its adjoining 96 acres, it was purchased in 1729 by a couple who were anything but farmers. The 44 year old Reverend Dr. George Berkeley or Barkley as it would have been pronounced then and his new wife, Anne. Berkeley was a Anglo-Irish scholar, philosopher, and priest in the Anglican Church of Ireland. And Anne was the daughter of a prominent Dublin politician and jurist, and an accomplished intellectual in her own right. A distinguished graduate and later faculty member of Trinity College Dublin, Berkeley had already published a number of influential treatises on subjects ranging from optics to epistemology, the field of philosophy concerned with the nature of knowledge, appropriate enough for our discussion tonight here at the Redwood. Berkeley had traveled widely through Western Europe, including an extensive period in Italy, and amongst his varied interests was an appreciation of Palladian architecture. His expansion of the Whipple farmhouse which he named Whitehall in honor of the former royal residence in London, included a portal that features one of the very earliest examples of Palladian design in America. So how in the world did such a cosmopolitan intellectual wind up in a town that was so very much the hub of the practical, a bustling center of trade that welcomed people of diverse religious traditions so long as they contributed to the city of Newport's vibrant mercantile culture. The colony of Rhode Island and Providence plantations at this point did not even have an institution of higher learning, unlike neighboring Massachusetts and Connecticut. For Berkeley, the choice of Newport was in fact grounded in very practical considerations, albeit ones for a grand plan that as it turned out was anything but practicable and soon came to naught. So a little over two and a half years after their arrival, the Berkeleys, along with a son born during their Newport sojourn, left Newport for Great Britain and never returned. His impact on the Newport community, however, was substantial and long lasting, especially on the intellectual climate that helped foster the Redwood Library and Athenaeum almost two decades later. The venture that brought the Berkeleys to the American colonies was the plan for establishing a college for the education of primarily Anglican clergy. Boston had its Harvard established in 1636 and Connecticut had its much younger Yale, but both schools were grounded in congregationalism, hardly sympathetic to the established church of England. And Britain's interests and the New World also faced serious challenges from their Catholic rivals, France and Spain. So a robust Anglican church could only help secure Britain's future in the Americas. Berkeley had spent time in London and had cultivated friendships with the leading intellectual and political figures of the day. He convinced several patrons who had influence in Parliament that an Anglican seminary in America was needed and not just to prepare colonists for church leadership, but to Christianize and to train indigenous people for spreading the gospel. However, the proposed site for this college to be named St. Paul's was not in Rhode Island, but in Bermuda, also known then as the Summer Islands or the Somer Islands. And Berkeley intended to use Newport as a staging area for the venture while he awaited the funding from Parliament. Now, those of you who are competitive sailors probably know that Newport is actually closer to Bermuda than is any other harbor in North America. So in that sense, 
Berkeley was quite practical. What was not well informed and practical was Berkeley's knowledge of Bermuda itself, which without ever setting foot on it, he had idealized as the perfect, one might even say Edenic setting for a college. And as for Bermuda's remoteness, well, that was part of Berkeley's plan. He reasoned that students, native and colonial, who grew restless with their training could not just slip away. So we can perhaps think of St. Paul's on Bermuda as sort of an academic Alcatraz, albeit a really cozy one. Nor would the colonial students be tempted by the allure of mercantile life in the pursuit of wealth, which would be too likely on the mainland. Ironically, Bermuda's remoteness also proved problematic for Berkeley himself. The four month voyage from England, which included a brief visit to Williamsburg, eventually landed in Rhode Island without first visiting Bermuda because the ship's captain couldn't find that isolated and small archipelago out in the middle of the Atlantic. Had he visited Bermuda, the idealistic Berkeley might have had second thoughts about how the small and not exactly thriving community there could support a college. And just as his research into the state of life on Bermuda was limited, so was his research into other more long-standing efforts at Anglican missionary work in the colonies by organizations such as the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in foreign parts. These other interests lobbied actively against parliamentary support of Berkeley's Bermuda plan. So long story short, the impracticalities of the setting and the project itself ran into the very practical realities of British politics. And Berkeley eventually learned that the promised funds around 20,000 pounds were not forthcoming and that the plan for St. Paul's was not to be realized. And so in the autumn of 1731, Berkeley's left returned to Great Britain. Berkeley was soon thereafter made the Bishop of Cloyne in Ireland and continued his ecclesial and scholarly life. He died in Oxford in 1753, a highly regarded intellectual whose contributions to philosophy we will discuss a little later. Here's a list of his life's intellectual output. The painting here, entitled The Bermuda Group, was painted by John Smybert, who included himself in the portrait, far left, looking out at the viewer. Smybert accompanied Berkeley and the rest of his entourage with the intent of being the art instructor at St. Paul's College, but left Newport soon after their arrival and moved to Boston, where he became the first portrait painter of note in New England. The painting itself is significant in that it was the first truly sophisticated group setting of its kind painted in the colonies. Smybert kept it in his Boston studio, which some have argued was America's first art museum. And it was quite influential for decades of painters who visited, even after Smybert died in 1751. The original hangs today in the Yale University Art Gallery. The others in the painting, in case one is interested, are Anne Berkeley with young Henry, born in Newport, along with a Miss Hancock, Anne's companion. The two men in the back, between Berkeley on the far right and Smybert on the far left, are John James and Richard Dalton, who are to be administrators at the ill-fated St. Paul's. And in the foreground, looking admiringly at Berkeley, or maybe at Anne, who knows, is Berkeley's patron, John Wainwright who wasn't part of the Bermuda group at all, but was included in the painting because he commissioned it. Berkeley's interest in an Anglican seminary in the new world was more than just a desire for the British colonies to be well stocked with Ang Anglican clergy. For Berkeley, America represented the fresh opportunities for a renewal of Western culture, which he saw as declining into decadence. In his poem, Verses on the Prospect of Planning Arts and Learning in America, written in 1726, Berkeley envisioned America as the setting for another golden age, the rise of empire and of arts, not as Europe breeds in her decay. 
So what did Berkeley bring to the life of Newport during those 20 months or so that he was here? We might start by asking what Newport brought to George Berkeley. Berkeley found the natural, beautiful settings of Aquidneck Island an inspiration for his deepest reflections on theology. He was known to spend hours on end at Hanging Rock, the prominent outcropping overlooking Satchewa's Point, in a spot that some later called Bishop's Seat. And we can imagine how the setting influenced what many regard as Berkeley's most important theological treatise, Alciphron, or The Minute Philosopher, which was a defense of theism and a vigorous denunciation of the new free thinkers school who saw the world more in terms of natural phenomena and rational thought than divine inspiration. Such beauty as he beheld in the countryside and seascapes of Aquidneck Island could to Berkeley only be the creation of a benevolent and very present God. But Berkeley was hardly a recluse and his presence in Newport was that of a renowned celebrity who brought intellectual and cultural sophistication to a community that by now had amassed the wealth and the stability that could produce a social class interested in the refinements of gentility marked by learning and aesthetic taste. Berkeley's personal library alone, which consisted of roughly 1,000 volumes, was an unprecedented inspiration for local intellectual life. A convivial and engaging conversationalist, Berkeley was welcomed, even a cherished guest, in the homes of Newport's leading citizens. Berkeley's closest acquaintance in town, the Reverend James Honeyman, top left here, the rector of Trinity Church, had already identified a number of Newport men of position and influence who were interested in higher learning. They included local men, such as the rector's son, James Honeyman Jr., the merchant and philanthropist, Henry Collins, the future governor, Stephen Hopkins, and even visitors such as Samuel Johnson, the Anglican priest, later known as the father of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, who eventually served as the first president of King's College in New York, later Columbia University. One account holds that when King's College was being renamed after the revolution, one of the first names floated was Berkeley College. We have no indication that at the time of the Berkeley's arrival, that the circle of intellectuals included the Redwood Library's later benefactor and namesake. Abraham Redwood, who had recently inherited his family's sugar plantation in Antigua, and was one of the wealthiest young men in the colonies, was at that time only 20 or 21 years old. Berkeley no doubt knew the family, however, as Abraham's older sister was Sarah Redwood Whipple, whose farm, the Berkeley's, and bought. At any rate, with Berkeley's encouragement, patronage, and mentorship, the Society for the Promotion of Knowledge and Virtue by a Free Conversation, otherwise known as the Philosophical Society, was established in 1730. Modeled on the coffee house culture that was very popular in London at the time, the group, which numbered between 20 and 25 men, met every Monday evening for debate and discussion. And in keeping with Newport's religiously inclusive nature, was open to citizens of all denominations. Their discussions represented an early form of academic freedom, with an emphasis on open exchange unconstrained by doctrinal concerns. In fact, members were forbidden from sharing the details of the discussions outside their circle other than some of the general topics being published. It is this organization, which lasted long after Berkeley's departure, that laid the groundwork for the establishment in 1747 of the Redwood Library and Athenaeum, which we celebrate this year. Redwood, then in his late 20s, had contributed 500 pounds for books, and the land was donated by Henry Collins. The immediate impact of the library and Athenaeum on Newport was substantial, making it, in the words of one visitor, the most learned and inquisitive community in the colonies. Now it's worth noting that the Redwood Library's initial collection probably did not include any of Berkeley's personal library. 
which upon his departure he had donated to Yale and Harvard. And as a way of appreciating the intellectual significance of such a library, the 900 volumes that Berkeley gave to Yale doubled the size of that university's collection at the time. Elihu Yale himself had only donated 450 books. Such was the rarity and power of books at a time when Rhode Island did not even have a resident printer until 1727. It's also worth noting that the Redwood Library's original collection was not solely devoted to intellectual matters, but that Redwood, ever the practical man of business, included books on engineering, farming, and the like. Here too, we might imagine a complementary influence from George Berkeley, who in addition to matters philosophical and theological, was seemingly interested in any number of subjects that could, in the words of the Redwood Library's founding mission, contribute to useful learning with nothing in view but the good of mankind. Of all the books that Berkeley published in his lifetime, the one that was something of a bestseller was his 1744 work, Cirrus, a chain of philosophical reflections and inquiries concerning the virtues of tar water, which begins, as we see here, with Berkeley's Ode on Tar. Hail, vulgar juice of never fading pine, Cheap as thou art, thy virtues are divine. Berkeley had learned of this dubious elixir while in the colonies, though, although there is no evidence of it being of local Newport use. He attributed his own health to the consumption of water infused with pine tar. And given the mortality rates in his day, I mean, he himself had four children predecease him. The philanthropically inclined Berkeley was eager to do something, anything to help especially the poor of Ireland. Although foul tasting, this folk treatment stood the test of time, as evidenced by this picture from Dickens's Great Expectations, written over a century later in 1860, where Pip's older sister is giving a spoonful of tar water to Joe, her long-suffering and genial husband. Another area where Berkeley had a substantial impact on Newport's cultural life was the church, in particular Trinity Church, the first Anglican church in town, more known for its Baptists and Quakers than for any tie to the established church of the mother country. The Trinity congregation began in 1698 and the current church on Spring Street was built in 1726. Upon his arrival in Newport, Berkeley was befriended by James Honeyman, the rector of what had grown into a sizable congregation. At the time of his arrival in Newport, Berkeley was the Dean of Derry in Ireland and was thus the highest ranking Anglican official to visit the British colonies. One of the legends about Berkeley's time in Newport is that when his ship had anchored in the harbor on January the 23rd, 1729, Berkeley sent a note ashore to Honeyman announcing his arrival. The note reputedly was delivered to the rector in the midst of Sunday worship, which he quickly drew to an end and accompanied the excited throng down to the wharf to welcome the town's new celebrity. And while Whitehall was being readied for George and Anne Berkeley, the Reverend Honeyman hosted them at his nearby estate. And during his Newport sojourn, Berkeley was a frequent guest preacher at Trinity Church. A contemporary account of the day notes that, quote, his preaching was eloquent and forcible and attracted large congregations to Trinity Church. I think we can imagine him preaching there from the triple decker pulpit there with its soundboard overhead there at Trinity today. And after he left in 1731, as a token of his esteem for that church community, and where in fact his recently deceased infant daughter Lucia was buried, George Berkeley commissioned an organ for the church by London organ maker Richard Bridge. The exterior wooden case of the original organ is still in Trinity Church today. The legacy of George Berkeley in America, memorialized today in the Trinity Church organ at Whitehall, as well as the Redwood Library in Athenaeum, extends beyond Newport. When he and Anne left Rhode Island, he donated the Whitehall estate to Yale, the income from which was the source of the university's first endowed scholarships. More on that later. And as noted earlier, his gift of 900 books was transformative for that fledgling institution and one of the 14 undergraduate residential colleges of today's Yale University 
see the scene on the left, is named in his honor. In Berkeley's vision of an Anglican seminary in the New World and the potential for America to provide a renewal of Western culture in a robust church were the inspiration a century after his death for the founding of Berkeley Divinity School in Middletown, Connecticut as well. And also, a few decades later, of a city on the eastern shore of San Francisco Bay. Yes, Berkeley, California is named after the same person who resided two and a half years at Whitehall in today's Middletown. Yet one more way that George Berkeley is fittingly remembered as a champion of both faith and intellect. There is even a private uh, for-profit college in New York City with campuses in New Jersey and an extensive online degree program that at its founding in 1931 chose a name and even a phony heraldic shield that was synonymous with learning. But why does Berkeley still matter today? Well, for one thing, Berkeley's contributions to philosophy have had a lasting impact. It would be well beyond the scope of this lecture to explain in any depth the essence of his philosophy. But in brief, if you think of the famous question, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, it doesn't make a sound. Well, then you have at least an initial idea of what he called immaterialism, the philosophical proposition that material objects exist as a collection of ideas rather than having independent existence, the Latin expression of which is esse est percipi. To be is to be perceived. Ultimately, this human capacity to perceive, Berkeley argued, is grounded in the reality of God. God is the ultimate perceiver, an argument that was at the heart of Berkeley's opposition to much of what later became identified with 18th century Enlightenment thinking, especially that of the French philosophers. Now, it's counterintuitive for us today to think of a philosophy in opposition to the Enlightenment as, any, as anything modern, but Berkeley established the theoretical groundwork for what became known as subjective idealism. The idea that reality is fundamentally mind dependent, which extends from David Hume in the later 18th century through the German idealists such as Hegel in the early 19th century, and even to Einstein in the 20th century and later pioneers of quantum mechanics. Tracing such influence is not a simple matter, as is the case with much of the evolution of philosophical thought, newer ideas typically emerge in opposition to, or as some reaction to earlier ones. It might be helpful for us to think of the famous Hegelian dialectic, which most of us have not thought about since college days, if at all. In brief reductionist form, the Hegelian dialectic argues that an idea called the thesis is at some point opposed by a new idea called the antithesis or the antithesis. But the antithesis does not simply replace the original thesis, but over time, the conflict between the two is resolved in a hybrid, the synthesis, which itself becomes a new thesis. And on and on and on proceeds intellectual and cultural history, at least according to Hegel. A common example is how modern day social democrat parties in Western Europe evolved after World War II. In this sense, then, we can appreciate that while later philosophers may have objected to parts of Berkeley's immaterialism, it lives on in varied hybridized forms well into our current day, three centuries later. Think of Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle, and you're also thinking of a descendant of Berkeley's immaterialism. And where do modern day Berkeley scholars sometimes reside while pursuing their studies? At Berkeley's house. Whitehall in Middletown. But I would argue that George Berkeley also matters today because of another strand of his personal philosophy that has occasioned much opposition, especially in recent years, but that in some hybridized ways lives on. The previously mentioned poem, Verses on the Prospect of Planting Arts and Learning in America, in which Berkeley expressed the hope for a renewal of Western culture in this new world, concludes with the stanza that may have ensured Berkeley's lasting legacy more than anything he wrote, 
as a philosopher. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. The four first acts already passed, a fifth shall close the drama with the day. Time's noblest offspring is the last. Berkeley likens Western culture to a five-act play, with the final act being the best one, the culminating one that occurs only because the culture moves on to virgin territory. Westward, the course of empire takes its way to Berkeley meant America in general, across the Atlantic from Europe. But over a century later, the expression became a motto of sorts for manifest destiny, the claim of the United States and all that lay west up to the coast of California. In fact, if you have been to the U.S. Capitol, you probably have seen Emanuel Lutz's mural, Westward the Course of Empire Takes Its Way, painted in 1856, which dramatizes westward expansion. It was probably this association with George Berkeley, more than his intellectual contributions, that was largely the basis for the naming of that city where the flagship University of California campus is today. In the 21st century, few words can more easily convey outdated political paradigms than the word empire. But I would suggest that while the word feels somewhat archaic to us today, the reality of the spread of Western read American influence, and especially our sense of American exceptionalism, is hardly a thing of the past. To study the work and life of George Berkeley today perhaps should include a reconsideration of deeply embedded cultural assumptions of our own course of empire. At a time when Canada and more recently the US are grappling with the not too distant history of state and church sponsored residential schools for Indians, schools which sought to erase their cultural identity and not incidentally had notoriously poor health standards that resulted in the deaths of many children well, we might do well to remember that Berkeley's plans for his St. Paul's College in Bermuda in 1730 included, and I quote, taking captive the children of our enemies before evil habits have taken a deep root. And finally, in the midst of our current day reckoning with America's past as a nation largely built on slavery and still infected with embedded cultural racism, we may be wise to reflect on not only the fact that Berkeley's farm and household at Whitehall were worked by enslaved people, but also the fact that in his 1725 proposal for the better supplying of churches in our foreign plantations and for converting the savage Americans to Christianity, George Berkeley made the case for the compatibility between Christianity and slavery, that in his words, slaves would only become better slaves by being Christian. I can assure you that where I work at Berkeley Divinity School at Yale, this reality of our namesake's personal philosophy sits very uncomfortably with our mission to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It is also a source of concern at Yale itself. You no doubt recall the re recent renaming of Yale's Calhoun College as Grace Hopper College because of the earlier namesake's association with slavery. Berkeley was hardly the same champion of slavery that John C. Calhoun was, but he's somewhere out there on that slippery slope, along with, of course, several of the nation's founding fathers. So why does George Berkeley matter to the history of Newport and to us today? As I hope I've made clear, we recognize his contributions to philosophy, and more particularly to the interest of intellectual life in our city and in our country. We recognize his interest in promoting the church and the Christian message in general, which despite the many missteps and benighted practices along the way is clearly a net good for a society committed to justice and mercy. We also recognize that George Berkeley may be an object lesson for anyone who possesses great gifts and a vision for human progress that we must always be mindful of our own cultural blinders. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you tonight as we celebrate the legacy of the Redwood Library and Athenaeum. I'd be happy now to take any questions that the virtual audience here may have with the caveat that I was an undergraduate and graduate uh, person in English and education, not philosophy. <laughs>
So happy to take questions. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much. Um, fascinating talk, of course, rich in its history and connection to the Redwood Library. Um, I'm going to read out a couple of the questions that we have. Uh, let's see. Well, um, have you heard of Samuel Beckett's West, Worst Word Ho, which is a satire about Barclay's statement, Westward, the course of empire flows. Beckett was a, a Luce's graduate student at Trinity College, Dublin. Luce was putting together the collected papers of Barclay in the 1920s, and Beckett quit as his research assistant. Interesting. Uh, I've heard of it. Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with it, but Berkeley, Barclay came in for a whole lot of, of uh, opposition uh, and even derision. Um, his, his philosophy uh, was not easy for people to accept this notion that uh, the material world does not exist except as a series of ideas. Uh, one of the more famous stories about um, his philosophy in materialism has to do with that, that other Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson, uh, the great um, British intellectual who in responding to uh, the, the philosophy of immaterialism famously said, I refute it thus by kicking a very large stone. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Berkeley was not immune to a lot of criticism. Um, okay, let me look at any other questions that we may have. Well, here's another one by Sean Moore. What do you think of Barclay's piece of a Barclay piece printed by James Franklin, Benjamin's Newport printer brother, right. that said that if you baptize a slave, you don't have to free him. You can find it reprinted later, but there is a librarian's note in a book at a at Brown at a Brown Library saying that it was first printed in Newport in 1731 by Franklin. Well, the piece that I read in there about uh, Berkeley stating in his 1725 proposal uh, that slaves would only be better slaves by being Christianized, uh, he actually repeats that at a sermon from the pulpit in Trinity Church. So it was not only something that was well known in his proposal, but it was also something that he unabashedly articulated uh, while living here in, uh, in Newport. Now, it, it's, it's awful and history teaches us how awful it is. Um, you know, we have to remember that uh, Mr. Franklin's brother, Benjamin Franklin himself was also a slaveholder. Uh, so uh, our dealing with Jonathan Edwards, one of the great theologians associated with Yale University. Uh, we also work on this difficult issue of that he too was a slaveholder uh, in the early part of the uh, 18th century. So um, yeah, it, it, there's no denying the things that Berkeley said or they got printed uh, and we stood by them. Well, it reminds me, of course, of our, uh, our connection given uh, Abraham Redwoods. Um, and people ask me often, and what I say is that the ideals by which the Redwood Library was founded surpass his own personal limitations. Right. Um, and so um, let's see if we have uh, another question. I'm not sure that we do. While you're looking, uh, I, one of the articles that I read in getting ready for this presentation had to do with the relationship between sugar and the sugar cultivation of the 18th century and libraries. So the Redwood is not alone at all in the, uh, in the association between its presence and its collection, et cetera, and the way in which the money was obtained to buy such luxuries in the middle and early part of the 18th century. Um, and the argument of this, this article is that lots and lots and lots of private libraries, which were indeed luxury items in the 18th century, uh, were financed by things like the sugar industry. Um, so, well, as it happens, yeah. As it happens, we have Sean Moore, who's asked two questions, who wrote the book and gave a lecture a couple of years ago on the founding of American libraries and, and slavery, of course. Right. Um, 
I am uh, reading a question by John Rock of Salve University. I am aware of his daughter that died while here in Newport, did not know about other children. Was that earlier in his life, the first marriage? Uh, the, the children, um, uh, Lucia, I believe, was the first child uh, to die. Uh, there were two subsequent children who died in infancy, and then he had uh, a son who was older than infancy who died, and it, it, it crushed him. Um, so uh, he had three who died in infancy and one as a more mature person. Um, and he was actually in Oxford at the time that he died. Um, he wanted to personally oversee the education of his remaining son. Um, it was so important to him. So they had left Ireland and moved to Oxford. And uh, that's where he was when he died. Here's a question directly uh, in keeping with your, your profession and your training. Today's youth seem to see religion as irrelevant. Even grads of religious colleges pay little attention to religion. How would this fit a thesis antithesis model? Of that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I would say that while generally speaking, that, that trend line that you're referring to is true, uh, there's been a good amount of scholarship written in the past decade about the revival of an interest in religious studies on college campuses. The, the real depth of that, or the, the, the nadir of that kind of retreat from religion on college campuses uh, was much more true in the 80s and the 90s, and that we are seeing a return of interest, both intellectual and formational, uh, in spiritual life on college campuses. But it is taking a, a hybridized form. What it will look like today and in the future will not be what it looked like in the you know 1950s or 1960s. It will look different. But in, in many ways, chaplaincy on college campuses is returning. Can you comment on Barclay and St. Columbus Chapel, asked Michelle Boyle. Uh, I think we'll have to ask the rector of St. Columbus, uh, and I believe she may be watching the uh, presentation tonight. So uh, I know that uh, the church you know, antedates his time there. Um, and it may be that this was just a, a fondness that people had for the memory of this, this great intellectual who lived amongst them. Um, but we may get a comment in the chat here because I believe she's online tonight. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you again, uh, Jerry, for this fascinating talk. I want to thank certainly the Colonial Dames and Bird Stats uh, and I want to make all of you aware that um, we will be presenting a full lineup of events for Black History Month in February, starting with Disappearing Inc., Rhode Island Black Literature, and the Black Press in Rhode Island, a conversation with Rob Dimmick and Ray Rickman of Stages of Freedom. Uh, that's their latest project, and that'll be on February 9th. Uh, so please visit our website and register to see all the offerings for Black History Month. Uh, if you're not a member of the Redwood, I would invite you to join. And if all of you would kindly subscribe, uh, that would be very helpful to us, certainly. So again, I want to thank our speaker and the Colonial Dames and invite you to join us on February 9th. Thank you all so much.